Hello, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to MTRI's second summer seminar of 2022. Each week in July and August, we'll be hosting a talk on the biodiversity and conservation of Gaspolik, or Southwest Nova Scotia. My name is Morgan Snare, and I'm a summer research assistant here at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute, or MTRI. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that MTRI is in, and we are meeting from Gaspolik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. MTRI is a research-based nonprofit nestled in Southwest Nova Scotia, near Kegley National Park and Historic Site, and within the Southwest Nova Scotia Biosphere Reserve. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Guestbrook and beyond. Tonight, I am very pleased to introduce Keith Egger. Keith is a professor emeritus at the University of Northern British Columbia and is now retired to Nova Scotia. He spent 29 years researching fungal diversity and ecology and teaching mycology-related courses, first at Memorial University of Newfoundland and then at UNBC. He continues to be involved in mushroom research and public mycology education in Nova Scotia. Next, I will hand this seminar over to Keith, but I would like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the chat window or wait till the question period at the end. And with that, Keith, I will let you take it away. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation to uh, give a talk in the seminar series. Um, so I retired uh, to the Bridgetown area after uh, spending uh, 29 years in the university system, first the Memorial and then at the University of Northern BC in British Columbia. And um, when I got here, I looked for small projects that might be of interest to continue some of my mycological interests. And one of the areas was uh, looking at Eastern hemlock. So, Eastern hemlock is under threat in northeastern North America. It's a, a signature species of the Wabanaki Acadian forest and occurs throughout New England and the maritime provinces. But a introduced uh, aphid-like insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid, usually just abbreviated HWA, now covers 90% of the range of eastern hemlock and could kill most of Nova Scotia's hemlock trees in the next decade. So given the potential decline in eastern hemlock, I had a question of, could this affect mushrooms that are associated with hemlocks? So I'm doing my work in Kejimkujik uh, National Park, a national historic site. And uh, this park it has some beautiful eastern hemlock forests, particularly old growth forests. These, uh, these sites are profiled particularly on the Hemlock and Hardwoods Trail in the park, which is one of the more popular hiking trails. And you can walk on these boardwalks in this beautiful hemlock forest, and you can feel the difference in the closed canopy of these hemlocks as the, the temperature cools by several degrees um, as you walk into these forests. They have moss-covered forest floor. They're really quite beautiful sites. So, I started looking at uh, what is the impact of hemlock decline on associated mushroom species. So I'd like to talk a little bit about my collaborators on this. I started this project in collaboration with Parks Canada as a, as a retirement project. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Matt Smith, who's the park ecologist, and Dave Ireland, who uh, has since moved to a different position in, uh, in Parks uh, Canada, but continues to interested in the project. My other main collaborator on this project is uh, Dr. Allison Walker and her lab group. Um, Dr. Walker is the director of the E.C. Smith Herbarium and she's been doing the DNA sequencing of the specimens that I've been collecting for this project. And she's also recruited two graduate students, Rebecca Matter, uh, a master's student, and she's uh, recruited a BSc honor student, Olivia Crooks. And both of these are, will be working on, on this project as well. So it has expanded considerably from when I initiated it in, in uh, 2020. 
I'll tell you a bit more about Rebecca and Olivia's work uh, as I continue through the seminar. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Yves Massicott, uh, with whom I did research and taught mycology courses at the University of Northern BC. He, uh, he also has interest in mushrooms from Eastern Canada in Quebec. And uh, so we talk about the different finds that I'm making. So I guess the first question is, why might we expect mushroom diversity to be affected by hemlock decline? Well, in some cases, it's because these mushrooms are pathogens of Eastern hemlock. So this is Ganoderma sugi. And this uh, fungus uh, attacks uh, living trees, but then continues to decay them after they die. So you might expect that if you have a fungus that's specifically associated with Eastern hemlock, that you would have an effect of hemlock decline. Although in this case, it might actually increase uh, productivity of the mushroom in some cases. Secondly, we know a lot of um, mushrooms form ectomycorrhizas. And these ectomycorrhizal fungi form these uh, fungal sheaths around the roots. There's an exchange of nutrients between the, the plant and the fungus. And uh, many of these are uh, common forest floor species that we find and collect in the, particularly in the autumn. But even though, uh, you know, we certainly would expect declines or changes in the diversity of species specifically associated with hemlock, even decomposer fungi that are decomposing wood or needles or leaves and material, these could also be affected if they require the specific conditions that are found in hemlock stands. So there's lots of reasons to think that hemlock uh, decline could affect the mushroom community. So the next question is how would we determine which mushrooms are, are susceptible to decline? Well, there's good literature with field guides, scientific papers, theses that uh, talk about collections in Eastern hemlock stands. So you can use that information. I've gone through much of this to flag species that might be of interest. Of course, you can directly monitor, which is uh, what I'm doing now and in going into these sites um, to collect mushrooms in these hemlock areas. But this doesn't have much predictive capacity. You're just looking at what's there and you're observing whether it continues to, to uh, be there after hemlocks, loss of hemlock. The other way we could determine this is by previous studies uh, called legacy studies where there was prior collecting in hemlock stands. And I'll talk about some work by a former student, Ivo Polak, in the early 1990s who collected within Kedjmakujik in hemlock stands. And this is proving to be quite a productive area for us to expand the project. So in terms of monitoring, I go into these sites, these beautiful sites, it's the highlight of my every few weeks to go in and hike into these sites. I collect the mushrooms, I photograph them, database them, I bring them home, make notes on ephemeral characteristics, spore prints if needed, and then they're dried in a dryer at temperatures that will not damage the DNA. So um, when I, after I've dried them, um, I will take samples in my home, home laboratory and take a sample for DNA sequencing that I send to uh, Allison Walker. I will make a mushroom observer record, and I will take the specimens and accession them into the E.C. Smith Herbarium at Acadia. So mostly I have been looking at uh, plots that I call, that are called the Eman plots. So these plots are um, um, part of the ecological monitoring and assessment network that was set up by Environment Canada in the late 1990s, uh, although I'm not sure when these specific sites were set up in, in Kejmakujik. But I've been focusing on two sites called uh, Eman BDA and BDB. And these are in old growth hemlock. They're beautiful stands. Um, and I've collected these fairly intensively, intensively in 2020 and 2021. 
And so far I've collected 100 species representing 51 genera. The most common genera are things that you see commonly uh, in the area, Cortinaria species, Amanita species, and Russulan lactarius, and then a smattering of other things. So I'm gonna, it, it's pretty hard to summarize the information for a hundred different species in a table. So I'm just gonna make subsets that I can kind of show the main trends of what I've been seeing in these plots. So the first thing is there's lots of variation from year to year. Um, if I look at just the subset of species, the, mainly the Amanitas and the Carnaria species, in, uh, in 2020 um, 20 and 2021, um, you can see that there's a, a lot of variation um, between the plots. Um, I didn't collect EMAN BDB as intensively in 2020, so it's a bit deceptive that there's only a few representatives there, but in 20, uh, 2020 and 2021, I did intensively collect the BDA site. And what's surprising is that really there's only a few species in common between uh, 2020 and 2021. And um, otherwise 2021 had, had you know, considerably had more species, but there were a number of species that appeared in 2020 that I didn't see in 2021. So lots of year-to-year -year variation. And part of that is explained because 2020 was a very dry year. I didn't start even collecting until September. Whereas in 2021, I collected, you know, in started in July and continued right through till the end of October because it was it was quite wet and periodic rains. And so the difference in a dry year and a wet year goes a long way towards explaining you know, the large year-to-year -year difference on the exact same plot. But the only species that I collected on both sites in all years was this little Clavulina coralloides, a coral fungus. Secondly, I've highlighted um, some of the species that were found on both BDA and BDB. And again, there's lots of variation between these two sites, even though they look you know, very similar in terms of both being old growth Eastern hemlock stands. So um, there are still a lot of species that I find uniquely on one site or the other um, in the same year. So 2021, um, again, most of the species were unique to the, to the site. So when you see a pattern like this, um, where you have a lot of variation year to year and a lot of variation on very similar sites, it's really telling you that there's a lot of mushrooms that I have yet to collect. Um, I'm probably just scratching the surface in terms of the 100 species that I've collected so far in these sites. So I'm gonna continue sampling for at least another two years on this project. And hopefully by that point, uh, some of this will be evened out and, and we'll start to see more repeat collections. Now, I mentioned that there was quite a large legacy study that we have, and this was a study done by uh, a master's student at Acadia University in the early 1990s, Ivo Polak. And Ivo um, surveyed a number of sites within uh, Kejmakujik, and um, many of these were hemlock-dominated plots. And uh, so that was for his master's thesis work. And then in addition, he started a PhD at the University of Toronto, and he uh, started a contract with Parks Canada in 1995, where he resurveyed two of his thesis uh, plots. And he also surveyed two new plots that had been set up by Parks Canada. So these were called SIMAB plots because they're Smithsonian Institute um, man in the biosphere plots. And uh, so one of these, SIMAB2, was hemlock dominated. And so I was able to um, also, I've been collecting the SIMAB2 plot to just compare to what Evo had found in 1995. And you know, point I make here, one of the 
wonderful things about Ivo's work is that he deposited specimens in the E.C. Smith Herbarium at Acadia. And there are quite a few. There's, I think, nearly 1,200 collections that he deposited in the herbarium that are representative of the mushrooms that he collected on the site. So these uh, I'll, I'll talk about a bit later because these are a really valuable resource for our, for our project. So comparing 1995 and 2020, when I went back and collected in the SIMAB2 plot, again, there's a lot of variation. These are the things that I found in 2020 and only four of them uh, Evo found in 1995. So those are shown here. And in addition, in 1995, there were a whole bunch of species that Evo found and collected from the SIMAB2 plot that I did not see in 2020 at all. So um, interestingly, a lot of these species, it doesn't mean I didn't collect them. It means I didn't collect them on the SIMAB2 plot. I collected them in the Eman sites, however, many of these species. So they were there, but they weren't on SIMAB2. So Evo collected 24 species in 1995. I collected a, a comparable number in 2020, and only four of them were in common across that 25 year interval. So one would ask why so little overlap? Well, one obvious uh, possibility is that it's 25 years is a pretty long interval, that those fungal communities um, undoubtedly changed over that time. The second thing is that um, the SIMAB2 plot had quite a significant disturbance from a defoliating um, gray moth, pale winged gray moth that happened in, in 2002 particularly. And a lot of the Eastern hemlocks were killed by this moth in 2002 and subsequent years. And so the composition of that uh, SIMAB2 changed from something that was much more like the two Eman plots that I collected um, and talked about to something that is much more of a mixed forest. And that probably explains quite a bit of uh, the variation and also why I was seeing these species that Evo collected, but in my Eman plots that were not disturbed. The third thing is the seasonal variation. As I, as I mentioned in talking about the Eman plots, 2020 was very dry and uh, I didn't collect SIMAB2 in 2021 at all, uh, which was a wet year. And perhaps I would have seen some of these species if I had collected them. And then the last thing are taxonomic issues. So Evo was collecting in 1995 when the state of taxonomy, the naming of these fungi was quite different than it is today. And these name changes make it difficult to compare. So I just thought I'd put in a slide to talk about, you know, why do names change? So we, we owe this to Carl von Linné or Linnaeus, who was the person who developed the way we name biological organisms with a genus and species. And the species name is more like a proper name. So in the example, Amanita virosa, virosa is from the Latin virosus, which means poisonous. So it tells us that this is a poisonous species. The genus, however, is the best assessment at the time of the taxonomist who's proposing the name as to what it's related to. And because of that, um, species names tend to change as we resolve species complexes, and also because if we find earlier specimens that have been named, they have priority over names that or over the same species that was given a different name later. But genus names change as we gather new information. So as we move through the, from the 18th century to today, and start using you know, morphology, the, the macroscopic characters of the mushroom to using microscopes and looking at microscopic characters to today when we routinely sequence the DNA of our specimens. Um, we have different ideas of relationships. They tell us very different things about what relationships are among the, the species. And so genus names change a lot. <laughs> 
And it, I know it can be very frustrating to pick up older field guides and then find the names are quite different than, than newer ones. So, you know, the question is, would common names be better? But common names have their own problems. They, they are different in different languages, so they can vary from country to country. And um, in fact, Linnaeus was setting out to resolve the problem the, of common names uh, being different all over. So there, there's no perfect solution. Uh, before leaving uh, Linnaeus, I just want to, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. No one has more completely changed a whole science and started a new epoch. So of course, what great scientist was Linnaeus talking about? He was talking about himself. So apparently Linnaeus was not a well endowed with modesty. So one of the issues I had when trying to compare Evo's collections with my collections was just mapping the names onto each other. So in some cases, they hadn't changed. Amanita flaviconia that he used is the same today. In other cases, it was a fairly simple one-to-one -one relationship. We know Swillus granulatus does not occur in North America. It's a European species. And the one we have in North America is Swillus weaveri. In other cases, it gets more complicated because it becomes a, a one-to-many mapping. So Clibia buteracea, even though there's only a single name, which is now Rhodoclibia buteracea, uh, if you look at the sequences in gene bank, there are clearly two different species under that name in gene bank. So it's not immediately clear which is the name that properly applies to one set of sequences versus the other. And with other groups like Amanita rubescens, which again is a European species, there could be three or four or more um, North American species in, that are, uh, were called Amanita rubescens uh, early on. But now, again, with further work with DNA studies, we know that there are now you know, several species that it, could, that it could be. So short of going back, um, to Evo's collections, there's no way of knowing which species he was referring to. The other thing is that Evo uh, didn't identify completely all of his collections. Again, remember, he was working largely with field guides and material from Europe, and he simply couldn't find a name that, that applied to many of the species he collected. So he just called them SB or SB12, et cetera. So I said I'd come back to the work of Rebecca Matter and Olivia Crooks, because they're um, going to really provide the information that will allow us to compare Evo's collections to the collections we're making today. So first, they're going to be assisting with recollecting the fungi from the sites that Evo collected. And we've, we've pretty much relocated all of Evo's sites in Keji National Park. And, uh, and very importantly, they're able to go to those herbarium specimens that Evo deposited in the, in the E.C. Smith herbarium, and they're able to sequence them. So that sequence will unambiguously tell us what species he was uh, using that name for and be able to map that onto the species and sequences that I'm finding and that we'll be finding um, in, on the project. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the distribution of some of these. So I use this, um, this tool called um, MycoPortal. And uh, this allows you to go in, put in a scientific name, and um, it will then give you a distribution throughout the world of where collections of this have been found that are deposited in participating herbarium, herbaria. So using this tool, I've been able to go in and you know, look at the various species that I've found and determine whether these are new records or, or if they're common things or if they're rare things. And that's been very interesting given some real insights into some of these different collections I've been making. So if we look at common species, there are some species that you know, just are occurring 
uh, everywhere, Asia, Europe, Western and Eastern North America, Canada and the Maritimes, you know, they're, they're found in all these places. Uh, there are some species that are somewhat more restricted, but very common in Eastern North America and in uh, Atlantic Canada. So we have a number of very common things that it's not surprising to see those. Um, we also have, though, a number of new things that um, are names that I came up with uh, in my collections that were um, not represented in that mycoportal site. So uh, from, you know, from Atlantic Canada or Nova Scotia uh, and often even Canada. So um, these are things that I say are, are things that are new names for this area. So we find a lot of them. Of 100 species I collected, 17 are new records for Nova Scotia, 11 for Atlantic Canada, 10 were apparently new records for Canada. Um, based on this one database. However, this is kind of deceptive because as I said, the taxonomy has changed so much that there probably are collections, but they exist under an older name. So this is getting back to the issue of, uh, for example, Evo's work. So it's probably more accurate to represent it this way, that there are a few things that are new. Uh, as far as I can tell, Amanita sub Aliacea and Amanita sub Maculata have not been found in Nova Scotia before. <clears throat> but um, these other ones, it's really going to depend on the work that, uh, that Rebecca and Olivia do in their projects to really uh, go back to Evo specimens to sequence those. And, to, and then we'll find out whether he was also collecting these species, uh, but he was putting them under uh, different older names, largely European names. So it'll be very exciting as they develop their projects to be able to link up some of these different taxa. Finally, there's a number of species that I just call rare species. These were things that, you know, may be common in some other parts of the world, um, have only been found sporadically in Atlantic Canada, and Nova Scotia. And I added another column there because it, many of the times when I would find these species, the collector would be KAH. And KAH is Ken Harrison. And a little tribute to Ken Harrison because he did some amazing work in Nova Scotia. Um, he was a plant pathologist at the Kentville Research Station, and he had a passionate interest in mushrooms. And Particularly after his retirement, he worked with the great mycologist Alexander Smith, with Daryl Grund, who was at Acadia University at the time. He worked uh, um, in the United States with Alexander Smith on collections. Um, he deposited more than 13,000 fungal collections over his six decades of mushroom collecting. And really, that's quite a remarkable accomplishment. Um, he had 58 publications and was an expert on tooth fungi, so hydnum, hydnellum, sarcodon, phalodon, erysium. But he also inter interestingly worked on truffle fungi, so he collected uh, rhizopogon and laphomyces, some from Nova Scotia, which is a whole different interest. So many times when I would go into this, I'd see, you know, one lonely little, little spot from Nova Scotia, and it would turn out that that would be something that was collected by Ken Harrison, uh, like this little Cufophilus borealis, this beautiful little mushroom, this Antiloma, again, Ken Harrison collected, collected this uh, many years ago. Um, he was an expert on hydnellum, and in fact, he described this species, hydnellum cumulatum. And so he had collections from Nova Scotia of this and an, another hydnellum, hydnellum frondosum, which I also found. Um, this little basidiomycete, uh, beautiful, slightly bluing pores, Illyria badia. Again, Ken Harrison was collected this in Nova Scotia um, prior this beautiful little coral fungus, Romeria primulina. Uh, he collected 
and uh, sent to Ron Peterson, who described it as a new species. And this Trichoderma alutaceum with, that I found in one of the sites, um, interesting little, little ascomycete fungus. Again, Ken Harrison had found this. So um, it's really a testament to um, just the, the hard work and contribution that someone can make by collecting intensively in an area over, over many years. So, um, so summing up, uh, we're making a good start at identifying mushrooms that are likely to be affected by decline of hemlock due to HWA. The DNA barcode sequencing is revealing many new and rare species. And I thank uh, Parks Canada for funding. I thank my colleague, Alison Walker, and her technicians and, uh, for doing the sequencing. And um, some funds came from the, uh, the Harrison family. And then finally, um, I'm looking forward to the next few years where I'll be collecting uh, further. Uh, Rebecca Matter and Olivia Crooks will be collecting for their respective thesis projects. And uh, they'll also be sequencing a lot of that material that's in the herbarium to find out what exactly Evo Polak was, was collecting from these sites in 19 in the early 1990s. So uh, an extraordinary data set. Brings in another 1,200 or so specimens that he collected. And then the final thing I mentioned, I put these on Mushroom Observer. Uh, Mushroom Observer is a, is a site where you can put up projects and observations of, of mushrooms. And um, I have uh, put my collections on this site and I have them in an associated project. So I invite you, if you're interested in seeing more of the things that I have collected from Keji, uh, go on the Mushroom Observer site and you can search my project and go into uh, you know, observations. There are 142 currently, more to add. And you can see the things that I've been collecting from, from these Eastern Hemlock plots. So that's it. Uh, that's what I want to talk about. So thank you all. And um, I'll pass this. Should I pass it back to you, Morgan, or should I leave it? Uh... That's totally your call. That's great. Um, thank you so, so much for the awesome presentation. Um, I'm going to open it up now to if anybody has any questions, you can type them in the chat box or feel free to turn your mic on. Yeah. To start off with, I do have one just kind of general curiosity. So between the two studies between 1995 and 2020, um, did Evo leave any like field notes about like the area by any chance? And have you had a chance to look at those? And if so, have they been helpful in possibly determining uh, how the mycological community is doing with different environmental changes? Yeah, good question. Uh, he did. He wrote, a, he wrote a thesis on the plots that he looked at. Um, in 1990 and 1991 for his thesis. And he wrote a report for Parks Canada on the plots that he looked at in 1995. And in those, he describes the plots pretty well. He describes their location. So I've been able to go back, or we've been able to go back uh, with, with Parks people, and like Matt Smith has helped us out. And uh, we've been able to go back and locate pretty much all of his sites. And some of them are very similar to what he described, you know, 30 plus years ago. They haven't changed all that much. Others have gone through an awful lot of disturbance, like I mentioned, the pale wing gray moth. And some, so some of the sites are really very different. The, they may have similar species there, um, but they're de demographically very different. The trees are, you know, regrowth rather than old growth. And there, there can be a lot of changes in these sites. So we are able to go back and look at some of his sites and he's noted on his sites whether hemlock was present. So we have a fairly large data set of, you know, once we sort out what, what his names mean, we have a pretty large data set um, to look at, you know, what is associated with hemlock and what is not, what, is, what, do, what do we find in places where hemlock isn't, doesn't occur. 
And this will really help us to kind of narrow down what are the mushroom species that are specifically hemlock associated. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, in the chat, we have Ron Arsenault asking, does Mushroom Observer harvest data from iNaturalist? Do you know? Um, I don't think it does. It, it does have a facility to go the other direction though. So you can, it has a, an export uh, facility that you can take your Mushroom Observer collections and put them into iNaturalist. Um, it's a different kind of platform. The two have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I, I tend to prefer the Mushroom Observer because I think it's, it's a little better if you're trying to set up a, you know, a, a scientific study. Um, but yes, I, I haven't done this yet, but I can take my material and I can put it into iNaturalist. So I haven't tried that export facility yet, but um, that's my intention to do that at some point. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions at the moment? I have a question. Uh, excellent job, Keith. Very interesting as always. I was curious on top of tracking like how species change, do you have a method of um, kind of tracking how their abundance can change? I imagine it's quite difficult with mushrooms considering the majority of their biomass is below the soil, but is there any techniques? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a hard one. Um, you, can, you can get some idea of frequency by sampling if you want to sample, like if, you're, if you want to use kind of DNA techniques to sample presence in various plots, but getting a measure of abundance for fungi is very difficult. You know, you hear the reports of, you know, humongous fungus where, you know, they've tracked a single clone that can occur over, you know, large areas, hectares in size, where it seems to be a single clone. But to do that kind of work, you need to have a different sequencing technique than I'm using. I'm using a barcode that you know, it gives me information on, on species largely, um, but it doesn't, it's not a, it's not variable enough to give me information on kind of the populations, on individuals. <clears throat> For that, you need something like the, <clears throat> the uh, techniques that are used to just microsatellite techniques used for people, for example. You need something that can distinguish individuals and that my, my techniques can't do that. So I don't really, have an easy way of getting at the abundance question. It's, it's, as you say, it's very hard for fungi because their biomass is below ground. And not only that, they, they may fruit so sporadically. There are, there are many reports in the literature of people and my own observations. I hiked a trail with my dog in the place I formerly lived in, Prince George, <clears throat> probably every year for 20 years. And yet one year, this mushroom came up in abundance that I had never seen before. And, and it wasn't just, you know, it popped up occasionally. It was like all over the place. There was this, this um, blue chanterelle, and I had never seen it in, you know, 20 years. And there are other reports in the literature like this, where people have, you know, collected in the same area for 20, 30 years and then seen something new. So it's very hard with fungi, and it also makes it very hard to deal with, you know, endangered, you know, species for fungi, because, you know, are they endangered, or are they just hiding out somewhere, you know, it's, it's hard to know with them. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions at the moment? I have an additional one. Absolutely. Um, so it's a it's a kind of a step back from your work, Keith. And I'm just kind of curious: Does the research community have a general idea of how climate change is going to impact fungi in Nova Scotia? Yeah, that's that, that's a hard one. Um, Sorry for giving you so many hard questions. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, probably the best correlation is that. That they have done a lot of work in Europe, not specifically with climate change, but with um, atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. 
because that affects particularly ectomycorrhiza fungi. And they, they did a lot of survey work in the 80s and 90s that showed that, you know, along nitrogen deposition gradients from pollution, they were seeing changes in the mushroom community. Uh, in terms of climate change, it's less about, you know, pollution sources, but and more about probably long-term drying trends. And how is that going to affect mushrooms? Well, that's, that's hard to know. They certainly require moisture. That's why in that you know, wet year in 2020, I was able to uh, find so many more species than I found in, in, or 2021, I found so many more than in 2020, simply because it was a very wet year. <clears throat> so you know, they certainly are affected by moisture levels. But how specifically that's going to affect them is you know, a hard, hard question. Um, important question, but you know, at least you know, at least with this, I can kind of carve out something around eastern hemlock because it is being affected and declining, and I can you know we can start to get at this question of you know, what what is associated with eastern hemlock. But as you start changing the composition of the forest, you know, it's going to be comparable. You know, you'll start to lose species while well, you will affect the mycorrhizal species and pathogens that are occurring on that host. But yeah, is that vague enough for you? That's <laughs> great. Thanks, Keith. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, hey. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Keith, it's Dave. I'm on the phone. I didn't see the slides, but I've seen them before and they're amazing. I just wanted to, to jump in and just say thank you, uh, you know, on behalf of Parks Canada, but also just on behalf of me. It was amazing sort of getting to know you over the last couple of years. And, and one thing that Keith's too modest to say, everyone, is that he did a lot of this work just uh, on his own. So as much as he's thanking people for funding, uh, there wasn't a lot of funding provided. This is Keith's blood, sweat, and tears. And so... Uh, just a quick comment, Keith, that it's, it's, it's a big thank you from us. And, uh, and I know our Mi'kmaq partners are also super appreciative of the work you're doing. So uh, how, how, and thanks. No, I'm looking forward to the next couple of years. It's a, it's a fun project. It's keeping me busy through the winters. So that's good. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? One observation, uh, one of the things that's the biggest challenge is uh, uh, doing the type of long-term observations that Keith is doing. And I think that's really important. Uh, one of the comments that uh, my dad, Ken Harrison, uh, made was it, to say that Nova Scotia has been properly looked at from the point of view of mushrooms it's a vast overstatement to say that 1% has been properly looked at. So anyway, that's my comment. And that's from the man who deposited 60,000 specimens. <laughs> yeah. um, it is daunting, but uh, I'll just say to Allison, boy, there's enough work uh, if you start getting into the uh, Ken Harrison collections at Cadia and start sequencing those, boy, you could, you could have a career doing this long after I'm gone. <laughs> so keep that in mind, Allison. It's worked there for your students for a long time. Me too. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Do we have any other questions at the moment or comments? Awesome. Okay. If not, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you again so, so much, Keith. This was a beautiful presentation. We learned a lot, especially about how just how much work goes into, especially this, a study of this magnitude. And that 1% is a huge overstatement. So yeah, that's huge. Um, so thank yeah. you again, everyone for joining us tonight. And for anybody interested in joining us next week on Thursday, July 21st, for our next summer seminar, we'll be joined by Luke Cowell, a nature photographer for a two-part online and in-person seminar on nature photography and learning the basics to capture the world and wildlife around you. I'd like to thank the Region of Queens for supporting us and our seminar series. 
As always, you can stay up to date with our seminars by following us on Facebook. If you'd like to watch any of them again, you can see them on our Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel. So we hope everyone stays well and we get to see you all again very, very soon. So again, a huge thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. That was fun. Okay, bye all.